The more we learn, the more confident we become. We learn new skills, new information, and more insights into how we should operate in the world. But are there any limitations on how much one individual can learn? And furthermore, does learning give us the ability to make decisions for other people? This video is going to be the start of a series of videos I want to do focusing on the idea of intellectual humility. School, YouTube videos, TikTok, social media, even hard serious research will tell us new things about the world. But by understanding what the potential limits of our knowledge can be, we might grow to be not so much of a dogmatic, overly confident scholar, but more of a humble, lifelong student. I want to kick things off with an essay from the academic Leonard E. Reed. Reed is the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, which is a free market capitalist think tank. And the essay we're exploring, I Pencil, is an advocate of free market capitalism. Now hold on, before you turn this video off and discuss, don't worry. We aren't reading this essay as being pro-free markets, but rather we're going to be reading it through the lens of intellectual humility. Maybe not what Reed had in mind, but the essay serves the job regardless. So without further ado, let's read this essay. Please don't unsubscribe. So the essay is written in the first person from the perspective of a pencil, hence the title, I Pencil. Although we've definitely pivoted more towards typing on our computers, pencils are still very much commonplace and almost seen as dispensable. There's so many of them that we've seen and used that we tend to devalue them. But this pencil wants to make an argument for its importance. But sadly, I'm taken for granted by those who use me, as if I were a mere incident and without background. I mean, there's a good chance there's a pencil within the room you're in right now. And you're not freaking out about it because really, it's just a pencil. It's a simple tool. Simple, yet not a single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me. This sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Especially when it's realized that there are about one and a half billion of my kind produced in the USA each year. Now you might take issue with the idea that no single person knows how to make a pencil. That's certainly a bold statement considering how many there are. But the pencil explains why this is by going into its history. Let's start with the wood. The wood from this pencil comes from cedar trees in Northern California and Oregon. Oregon. But to cut down those trees you need saws and trucks and all sorts of gear. Think about all the processes used to create such gear. Like the saw for instance. You need to mine the ore and then turn that steel into the saw, along with other things. But even just considering all the resources and time required to make the tools, what about the workers? These workers need beds to sleep in, clothes, shoes, food, even a morning cup of coffee requires a lot of beans, processing, ceramics for the mug, you get the picture. A lot of resources, people, and time are all coming together just simply to get the wood required to make these pencils. But after all that, the logs are shipped to a mill somewhere in California. For this to happen, you need to consider all the people and resources required to construct the rails, the cars, the engines, and the mill itself. Once the wood arrives at the mill, they're waxed and kiln dried, which obviously takes effort, but also just general maintenance of that mill requires things to supply the power, lighting, and even just general custodial upkeep. After that, the wood is cut into those specific octagonal rods using, you guessed it, more specialized machines, gear, time, and manpower. Next we get the lead in the pencil wood, but apparently it's not really lead. The graphite is mined in Sri Lanka. Consider these miners, and those who make their many tools, and the maker of the paper sacks in which the graphite is shipped, and those who make the string that ties the sacks, and those who put them aboard ships, and those who make the ships. Man, that was a long sentence. That graphite is then mixed with clay that comes from Mississippi. A bunch of chemicals and other ingredients are then added to get the size and firmness right. Special wax from Mexico is also added to increase the strength and smoothness of that lead. Next, we need to paint our pencils. Because obviously we can't just have bland wooden pencils. We need those shiny yellow Ticonderogas we're all familiar with. This paint called lacquer is made from castor beans which are grown and processed somewhere in the world. Now you'll also probably remember that our pencils have a bit of metal at the end which holds the eraser. That end metal is brass, which requires people to mine zinc and copper, and then turn that into sheets of brass. Black nickel is also applied to make those rings around the metal, and black nickel doesn't grow on trees. I don't even know what black nickel is. Finally, we get to the eraser. This comes from a special oil whose name I can't say on YouTube or else this video will get demonetized. But look it up. This oil comes from Indonesia and is mixed with sulfur chloride to make the eraser. So that's all our ingredients. And obviously you require further resources and people to put this thing together. But yep, 
That's how you make a pencil. So what Reed means by no single person can make a pencil is that it would probably take more than a lifetime to single-handedly require the resources, required to get the resources, required to get further resources, in order to get other resources, you, you get the point. To create a pencil, you require millions of human beings to come together with their own specialized knowledge and skills to add a little bitty part to the overall creation process. There isn't a single person in all these millions, including the president of the pencil company, who contributes more than a tiny, infinitesimal bit of know-how. The only difference between the miner of graphite in Sri Lanka and the logger in Oregon is in the type of know-how. The point is that there's no one single mastermind behind this operation. There's no one with a blowhorn ordering around people to do this and that, but rather millions of people who don't even know each other and might even hate each other if they did meet, are working together to add a little bit to the creation of this extremely simple and mundane thing. There is a fact still more astounding, the absence of a mastermind, of anyone dictating or forcibly directing these countless actions which bring me into being. Now after this, Reed takes us in a libertarian direction, talking about the reasons why they cooperate and the invisible hand and all that. But reading this through the lens of intellectual humility, we might realize that we as a single individual are not enough even to make a pencil. Our knowledge is limited, and to create great things we need cooperation from other people with their specialized knowledge. A lot of people may take a class in college, or listen to a speech, or read a book, and think they understand the world and how it should be run. They become gung-ho and dogmatic and furious at anyone who disagrees with them. But hopefully this essay can remind us that the world is a complicated place, and if we can't single-handedly figure out how to make a simple pencil, maybe we shouldn't dogmatically command others on how the world should be. But that's just my two cents. Agree? Disagree? Let me know in the comments below. Feel free to read the article online if you want to see Reed's more libertarian prescriptions near the end. I think it should be free. But before that, be sure to subscribe, like, and hit the bell button below. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.